the early service, I shared uh, with some of the Michigan fans in our congregation that we're wearing blue today because it's Advent. They may not have known that, but I wanted to share that with you. And we do so humbly, having been a part of yesterday. <laughs> so would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. What does the end of the world have to do with preparing for Christmas and the birth of Jesus? On the surface, this is a terrible way to begin our happy advance to Christmas Day. Shouldn't we be reading about shepherds and angels? Shouldn't we uh, be talking about the wise ones from the east or even the star of Bethlehem? And how can we forget the cooing newborn baby in the barn with all of the cattle lowing around him? Well, why have heaven and earth collapsed instead? The sun and moon and stars rain fire upon us. Once again, we have to ask on the first Sunday of Advent with the first reading from Luke, what have you done with our precious baby boy? Today's readings from Luke open our journey to Bethlehem already in Jerusalem. And it's only a matter of days before Jesus' arrest, his fake trial, his real crucifixion, and his real resurrection. We find ourselves standing in the great temple of Jerusalem, listening to Jesus' final public sermon. He's not speaking wistfully about his childhood at the carpenter's bench next to his father Joseph in his early years, or even his ministry on the Sea of Galilee. He is not healing the sick, although they are all around him there in the temple. He is preaching about the end of life and the end of the world as we know it. The 21st chapter of Luke opens rather quietly. Jesus is in the temple and very still as he's watching people bring their tithes to the Lord. He witnesses a woman, a widow, who comes to the treasury of the church, or excuse me, the synagogue, and puts in her gift. He hears this sound and he realizes what she's done is drop in all of her life savings. In her poverty, she has given abundance. And he points this out. We call this story the widow's might. She gives all that she has for the love of God. But then a pivot happens almost instantly. He moves, he turns his focus to an apocalyptic future filled with severe challenges and changes. The followers of Jesus will face false messiahs who make fake claims and lie about themselves and the sequence of events that have happened and what all those events mean. They misinterpret everything out of falsehood. Jesus' followers, it says, will face wars and insurrections, natural disasters, and cosmic terror. Did someone just talk about an insurrection? And, and did, I didn't hear anywhere in this text the mention of QAnon, but I'm beginning to wonder. And before this ends, before the end of time arrives, the people who call themselves Jesus' followers will have to bear witness to their faith. While others will claim the end of the world as we know it, the followers of Jesus will be called to say, guess what? Time belongs to God. And God decides when the end is here. Not you, not me, not even Jesus, God. This witnessing, Jesus says, will come under great stress and pain. And in what appears to be an absolute contradiction after he's laid all this out, Jesus declares that through this all, God will save every hair on the head of those who are the followers of Jesus, right? Then Jesus delivers what I call the gut punch. The city in which they are standing, the temple in which they are praying, 
the place in which he is teaching will be utterly and absolutely destroyed. And that actually is an event that happened just 30 years after he delivers this prophetic word. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was flattened. It's as though he's telling them something that no one wants to hear. They will lose their homes. They will lose their places of worship. They will lose their livelihoods in many cases. They will lose their neighborhoods. In all cases, they will lose family and friends and perhaps even their own lives. Boy, this guy really knows how to bring a message. The verses leading up to our reading today are enough to literally put the fear of God in you. Only after this long apocalyptic prelude does Jesus come to the text of the day, the arrival of the Son of Man on a cloud in power and glory. Are you catching on that the arrival of the Son of God involves a lot more than a baby in a manger on Christmas morning? The Christmas story is just a very small part of the entire cosmic design, which involves the shaking of the foundations of the world through wars and insurrections and earthquakes and horrible storms, the collapse of heaven, and the arrival of hope in the midst of terrifying truth. Jesus calls everyone in the face of everything that is coming to be on guard so that you're not sideswiped, as Eugene Peterson says in the message. He calls everyone in the temple congregation that day and ever since then to be alert in all times. He calls everyone to depend on prayer for deliverance. Listen to this, his last words to us in this passage today. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And for those who don't know, the Son of Man is a phrase that you will we'll hear throughout this year in the Gospel of Luke. It is the Messiah. It is the one who is coming. The Son of Man is sort of all in all, right? We pray to find the strength to escape all these things. The Greek word here for escape is used only three times in the New Testament. And it means to flee out or to run away. So what he's saying is, in a sense, pray to run away from all these things. It doesn't sound right, right? It doesn't sound like Jesus. It's, it's almost like he's issuing a tsunami warning. And we, when, in the beach where we go in North Carolina, there's a sign on the beach that gives a warning about tsunamis. And I've always thought as I'm standing there reading the sign, if I'm reading this sign and a tsunami is coming, it's too late, right? It says evacuations recommended. Yeah, <laughs> get, a far, get as far away from the ocean as possible. Get to high ground as soon as possible. That's what the sign reads, right? Tsunami coming, tsunami warning. That's sort of what this is. He's telling everyone, to get away, to take care. It's not that he's running away from reality, but saving yourself to live another day. We find strength in these times in this dual movement of reflection and action. We also look to the natural order of life to see our way through disasters, to the other side of hope. In the shortest parable we will ever see in the New Testament, the mini parable of the fig tree, and by the way, all the other trees, Jesus points out that the sprouting of leaves tells us that summer is already here. So this arrival of events beckons us to pay attention to the coming of the kingdom of God that is near. But you have to literally read the leaves before you can harvest the fig. You, you have to read the signs before you can experience the fullness of God's kingdom. So how do we do this? How do we read the leaves? How do we find, if you will, strength to escape all these things? First, to find strength to survive, to escape all these things, we must be aware, the text tells us. We have to be aware. I think awareness is a spiritual gift. It's a calling. To be aware is to be completely attentive. 
If you are not attentive, you will miss the moment that you have. You will miss this moment and all other moments, the moment of your calling to do the right thing. Awareness is not simply what we read with our eyes or hear with our ears on the news. That's not awareness. Jesus is telling us to find the strength to escape all these things. You need to fully engage all of your senses. And that's what awareness does. It draws every one of our senses in. Awareness engages all of our senses, seeing and listening and touching and tasting and smelling. Pray with all your senses wide open, is what he's saying. Pray with your eyes wide open, your ears open, your fingers touching, your tongue tasting, and your nose taking it in and smelling. Many years ago, I was blessed to have some time on a farm, an Amish farm in the Millersburg area. And I was with the Amish farmer who, when we were walking through his field, reached down, picked up some dirt, and ate it. Uh, He warned me he was going to do it, so it's not like I didn't see it coming. But he tasted his dirt, and I watched him do this. I asked him, what are you doing, right? He said, this way I can tell if the soil is alive or if it's dying. And then all of a sudden, a smile broke on his face as he had mud in his mouth, literally. He looked at me and he said, this tastes good. My prayers have been answered. How many of us know how to taste dirt? (laughs) How, how, how to be so connected to the earth that we're a part of that we can taste the goodness of the soil in front of us. Usually we think of it as something kids do when they're making mud pies out back, right? But this is what he did to test his soil, to see if it was good or bad. Now, many of us can do that with food, and some of us did it very subtly on Thursday There were foods that we tasted that we didn't do so subtly. We kept asking for seconds. Remember that part? But there are other foods that were on the table that we just sort of moved aside. Now, sitting beside me on Thanksgiving was my four-year-old grandson, Rylan, who loves cranberries, so he got all of mine, too. (laughs) And that's that's great, because he loves the taste of of that berry. But we do it, and we can do it in all places, wherever we are. We can taste with awareness, we can taste what's in front of us. On Thanksgiving Day, when I was sitting next to Rylan, I also experienced the fullness of awareness of touch. As he held my, my hand and we prayed, and when the prayer ended, he held it longer. And then he pulled my hand up to his lips and kissed my hand and said, Papa, I love you. There was no guessing at what he was doing. He was experiencing in full awareness the love that he had through touch. His sense of my presence and my sense of his was heightened by our hands holding on to each other. And later, listening to my granddaughter Emran's breathing as she fell asleep in my arms and her parents, of course, telling me, you need to put her down now, pop up. You need to let her sleep. And of course, I didn't want to do that, right? I just wanted to hold on to her while she slept, listening to her breathing just a little bit longer so I could connect with her life just a little bit more. But in her stillness, I could hear the throttle of her, of her voice resting as she breathed. And then when she awakened at the end of her nap, I had a tremendous sense of awareness as well as she needed my help as I used my nose to help Emerin and everyone else in the family escape a certain smell. My nose was made aware, and I responded. And all grandfathers need to do that too, by the way. You see, you see how it goes? All of our senses are engaged when we're aware. Thanksgiving prayers are answered through heightened awareness of the fullness of life. And here we stand on the edge of Christmas at the beginning of Advent. And our awareness 
is, of, of the senses is only part of what Jesus is talking about here. The second thing he wants us to be aware of is this. To find the strength to survive all these things, we have to be on guard. It's not just a matter of a sensory awareness, but an on-guardness. To this end, being on guard engages what I would like to call our sixth sense, our intuitive nature. We need to be aware that the global community and the planet are spinning out of control. And Jesus has laid out the case in this passage for the world turned upside down. He has shown us that we need to protect this planet, that we need to protect one another from the craziness of these times. He has told us that we have the chance to make a difference by being on guard. In his case, the Roman Empire was literally breathing down his neck. And 48 hours later, they would have the boot of the empire on his neck as he hung on the cross. As a messianic leader, he was threatened unto death by Caesar and his minions. You and I cannot exist in this state, in this country, in this world, being oblivious to the onslaught that is being delivered in a climate imbalance and a planetary distress, in hot wars and cyber wars, those around us and among us who would seek to destroy democracy and that which we hold precious in our land and replace it with autocracy and fascism. These challenges that we hold onto in the midst of this are self-evident, right? As we treasure a place that we can call home that is safe, we have to be on guard. After all, we have to remember these writings and this deliverance is about apocalypse. It's about apocalypse. This is apocalyptic writing. And, what, and the word itself comes from the Greek, it means uncovering, which is the derivative of the word to, to take the cover off. When Jesus is speaking about all these challenges and the change and the balance of life, what he's doing is uncovering things in the world around us. He's revealing that we may not see these things, we may not sense these things, but we have to be on guard. And when something feels all wrong, or at least partially wrong, we need to respond. For example, this is too obvious an example, but I'll share it. I was listening to the news some time ago, May 13th, and I heard the United States Congressman from Georgia, Andrew Clyde, say, as he was talking about the insurrection in the United States Capitol on January 6th, it was a, quote, normal tour of the Capitol. Those were his exact words. Now, if you listen to something like that and you're not on guard, then you're not awake and you're not alive. If you're on guard, then your senses are working. You see how this works? Each of us should be fully aware and on guard every day. If we're to find strength to escape all these things, as Jesus says, those close at hand and those writ large in our lives and in this world. In his poem, The Growing Edge, which I shared on Friday in First Reflection, Howard Thurman writes this. All around us, Worlds are dying and new worlds are being born. All around us, life is dying and life is being born. The fruit ripens on the tree. The roots are silently at work in the darkness of the earth. Against the time where there shall be new leaves and fresh blossoms and green fruit, such is the growing edge. It is the extra breath from the exhausted lung the one more thing to try when all else has failed, the upward reach of life when weariness closes in around all endeavor. This is the basis of hope in moments of despair, the incentive to carry on when times are out of joint and men have lost their reason, the source of confidence that had held them before, when the world's crash and dreams whiten into ash, the birth of a child, life's most dramatic answer to death. This is the growing edge incarnate. Look well to the growing edge. My friends, we should seek the growing edge. We should look to the growing edge incarnate.
For here we will discover all that we need to embrace the coming of the Lord. Amen.